And so those who do not know my voice yet, my name is Rachel Marquez, used to be Rachel Rodriguez. I'm the Countywide Address Management System Coordinator um, and I work for uh, the County of Los Angeles in the Internal Services Department uh, within the GIS unit. So we manage enterprise GIS solutions within the county itself. Um, some of the other projects and programs that we have going is the LARIAC program with the uh, satellite or the imagery. Uh, and they have some other fun things going on, going on with that. Um, and we provide the data services uh, free and open to the public. Most of our data sets are available um, at the county's open data portal. And a quick little plug for LA County's GIS day. Um, I believe registration is open for that now, um, but it is gonna be November 18th and 19th. Uh, we have a set of speakers, uh, an exhibit hall, some galleries, um, and just a great way to go ahead and try to communicate and meet folks and understand different programs and things that are going on with the county and really the state. <laughs> Uh, one of our keynote speakers is going to be the new California Geographic Information Officer, Isaac Cabrera. Um, he is going to be speaking about what he, how he envisions, you know, GIS moving forward as it relates to data collaboration, integration, um, getting more local county um, communication and collaboration particularly as it relates to um, emergency response, emergency services, county services. Uh, he, he's really focusing on the, the broader data collaboration um, concept. So that's very exciting. Uh, hopefully we're getting more people on here. Alrighty. All right, so it's 10.05. We're just gonna go ahead and get started since I already sort of did my intro. <laughs> um, we have um, several people on here, particularly as it relates to the countywide address management system uh, and its modernization effort. Um, so really this stemmed from uh, the CAMS program not really being touched or updated for several years. So we decided that the infrastructure was a little bit outdated, the communication methods were a little bit outdated. Uh, so I went ahead and got a internal county grant funding uh, to onboard um, some consultants to assist with uh, collaborating with the 88 cities within Los Angeles County um, to better build the relationship to identify what type of infrastructure the cities would want to um, be able to contribute data to the county. Um, and then also identifying, you know, the schema challenges, the downstream uses of addresses that you guys have at your particular cities so that we could better um, understand and update. Um, so I have uh, my consultants on here, both uh, Michael Baker and one spatial. And then I have my new BFFs of the world, uh, Martha Wells and Ed Wells, um, that are leading experts um, as it relates to addressing within the country and other countries as well. Um, they could probably give a brief overview on themselves, but you know, it's really building this collaboration and expanding the use and knowledge of addressing so we could um, better help all of our programs and services downstream. Uh, I'm always available to assist anybody <laughs> who wants to chat. Um, we could work on anything you guys want, but addressing is our main focus for this. So with that quick little introduction, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Martha to talk about addressing best practices. Thanks, Martha. Can I share my screen, Rachel? Uh, I believe you are able to. Yeah, let me stop here and you should have no trouble sharing. Okay, here we go. 
and everybody Martha's doing this is a favor to me. <laughs> Last minute, I was actually hoping to have a representative from the US Postal Service today, but um, they were told to retire, so. <laughs> I'm uh, working on getting, let's see, it, it's not wanting to share. Now. Yeah, no problem. Um, Martha, there should be a green button at the very bottom that says uh, share yeah, screen. And I'm getting a screen and it's giving me error messages, unfortunately. Oh, okay. oh wait a minute. Okay. Let's try that. Let's try. Let me see if I can get to my PowerPoint here. Wait a minute. That one right there. Okay. Now, I've got to open up my system preferences here for just a sec. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. yeah. So I first met Martha and Ed um, through ERISA, which is the GIS or Professional Association. Um, Martha teaches the addressing work, several addressing workshops for them and is a great leader um, to okay. help. I'm going to, have to, I'm going to have to back out and come right back, OK? OK. <laughs> She's uh, extremely instrumental in a lot of the um, services and products related to addressing within your SS, so. We got hold music, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, share screen, yeah. Okay, let me get to that. Um, PowerPoint, there it is. Okay. Now, is everybody seeing my screen with my slides? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So let's start up the slideshow. Okay. Now we have music. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to do a really brief uh, presentation. Some of this is taken from a workshop that I teach at ERISA that is uh, about eight hours of time. Actually, it's about a 10 hour workshop, but we usually give it in about eight hours. So it's, this is going to be the speed talk version. But um, part of this is, you know, in terms of what is a best practice in terms of assigning addresses and maintaining addresses, um, I'm going to go through this really fairly quickly for you. Um, so uh, bear with me as we do that. You know, what is addressing about? It's, it's an, a location identification system, and we use it for a lot of different purposes. Obviously, mail and package delivery, locating things, uh, emergencies, disasters, services, navigation, uh, lots of things get used, and addresses are sort of the ubiquitous thing. We all know our own address. People don't know their parcel ID or their account numbers for things, but they do know that. Addresses are local in nature and their ad addressing is a function of local government across the United States. It is vested in the local governments, which means the, the, as they would say, the lowest level, which I think is actually the highest level, the local, the towns, the cities, if there is not an operative town or city in the county government, but that's the level at which addressing is done. And it seems to have remained a mystery at the federal level because at some point they thought all the states had a full list of all the addresses in every state. And they were um, disabused of that notion by the states real fast. So it's a local thing. And they've been assigned over a long period of time, not always consistently as you are finding out. And what's right in one jurisdiction may be wrong in another jurisdiction. We find jurisdictions right next to each other who have, you know, the even, some of them have the even numbers on the right side as the numbers increase, some of them have them on the left side. There's not a right and wrong. The, the issue is to be consistent and to follow a discernible pattern. Because what you're, what you're aiming for, and the thing that I always keep in my head is if I'm standing in the middle of a town, the middle of Los Angeles, and I've never been there before, and I'm trying to find a specific address, the addresses have to be logically organized. If they're just random numbers, there's no way you're gonna be able to know where that number specifically that you're looking for is gonna be found. If they go in order, two, four, six, eight, or one, three, five, seven, nine, you can find it. So usually a jurisdiction, say a city or county, or a portion of a community has a specific discernible pattern. 
And what you want to do is figure out what that pattern is. It was probably done before you ever came on the scene. There probably been a number of people who've manipulated it over the years, but it's, it is a thing. And the times when it doesn't work is when you don't apply it consistently. We had one jurisdiction where we found the number one on a street somewhere in the middle of the 1400s. That's not consistent. When you've patched it inadequately or inconsistently over time, when it's based on some other system like parcel numbering, and the thing that happens there is parcel numbering doesn't need to be logically organized. Uh, so the surveyor just kind of goes around and around and around and puts numbers on lots. And you wind up with number one being across the street from number 265. And it, the, it's, the odd and even isn't maintained. Um, parcel numbering, coordinate values, other invisible metrics really don't work very well. And you, what you want to say is, can a person walking or driving through this area understand the system based on the visible street sign names and the logic of the numbering, find the approximate location of a specific address? So it works as a navigation system. And it's logical because streets are named. Um, there's often a pattern to the naming. Um, the, the names are visible on the landscape. There are street signs. Structures are numbered. The numbers are organized in some kind of numeric order. The numbers are visible on the structures, address numbers, or as they're often ca called, house numbers. And the numbering and naming patterns have been consistently applied throughout the area. So that's when we went to develop a standard for address data for the United States. And uh, Ed and I are both co authors of that, along with an, a lot of other people, but uh, we had a pretty major okay. role in it. Um, we refer to this as an address reference system. And we've documented that in the, in the um, federal address standard that Federal Geographic Data Committee put out. It's published and there's a, a link for it in here. And I will be happy to give you this set of can distribute them because I know this is pretty quick. Um, but the address reference system describes the business rules that each one of you as a local jurisdiction uses or has used to assign addresses. Um, there's about three types that we found in the United States. One is the, uh, the grid with 100 blocks all neat and, and uh, laid out in rectangles or squares. There are the linear versions that begin a street and just keep numbering it till it ends. Those are used in a lot of areas with very um, difficult terrain. Um, you look at uh, counties up in the mountains in the Rockies or in the Sierras. The streets run along the contour lines, not in any grid pattern. And that's what we call a linear pattern or a non-axial pattern. Um, there are a few that are area-based where numbers are assigned kind of randomly, but within a fair, usually within a pretty small area. Each one of these has some common components that describe the rules that you use for assigning and for doing quality control. And the Codifying this into the standard was really a product of looking at quality control for addresses. How do you tell if this address is correctly placed and follows the rules? And the person who was working on that at the time called me up and said, Martha, how do I know whether the odd numbers belong on the odd side, on the left side or the right side of the street? We have to know what the rule is before we can tell you whether it's in the right place or not. And I had one of those moments of, well, duh. Yes, of course you need to know what the rules are first. So it's really important for quality uh, to be able to know what the rules are because you build your quality testing around the rules. So all those rules are local and what you have in one town is probably not the same as what your neighbors have next door um, to some degree. And here's a basic description of those three types that we just talked about and I won't go through that again. Hey Martha. Um, Yes. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure you're aware that you're sharing our uh, the speaker view, and we can see. Oh, okay. Um, slides mm -hmm. there, which is fine, but I just want to make sure you. Yeah. Got what you wanted out of this. It's fine with me. Um, okay. I, I, unfortunately, I I hate to interrupt and go back to figure out how to move it over. To yeah. The other I've yeah. Got. No problem. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so, you know, looking at, well, when was your community addressed? And what do you know about, 
when do you, what do you know about that? And what are some of the observable features you can see? Um, we refer to that as forensic address discovery. And you, know, you, you go back and you stare at your maps and you look at them and you figure this out and you start writing down the things that look like they're consistently made rules in your system and figure out where they came from. You may have documentation for that. Um, the streets are your base. Generally, things are organized around the pattern of the street network, whatever you got, areas with a grid, areas that have linear um, descriptions because of topographic features, um, you know, along the edges of rivers, lakes, uh, mountains, uh, other types of things like that. So identifying your street network and cleaning up your street network is the first critical step in getting to, to good addressing. Best practice, make sure every segment has a name, make sure every segment connects to all the other segments of a road that has the same name. Be sure everything, you know, make clean up the, the geometry and clean up the organization and the naming. We find a lot of inconsistency where names are applied to individual street segments and it might be St. James Street and in some places it's ST period, some places it's ST, some places it's S-A-I-N-T. Humans know that those all mean the same thing, but the computer doesn't. And getting that stuff cleaned up is really the first step that you wanna go through in cleaning up and, and organizing your address data. It can take a surprisingly large amount of time. Um, you know, how, the, how are your streets organized? Are there themes? Do you use directionals like north, south, east, and west, or northwest, southwest, et cetera? Um, do you require, uh, as a number of cities in, in the state of Washington require their streets to only be done with numbers? They don't allow names for streets, so to speak, or you know, other things, other words. Um, are there things that you prohibit? Are there things that you don't allow? I, as a best practice, do not allow duplicate names, including the suffix. So don't allow Elm Street and Elm Way and Elm Court. People forget that suffix when they're calling in an emergency and it can cause a lot of confusion. Um, do the names run for the distance of the street? What happens if there are breaks? In the, you know, a block gets cut off and you have the same street on either side. Um, there's a lot of rules like that that you want to identify um, because going forward, you wanna perpetuate those rules. You wanna continue those rules as you're going forward um, or change them if you really, if they really don't work for you. Um, street names, consistently recorded, spelling, punctuation. Again, the directionals, are they all there? Are the street types con uh, consistent? Does every segment of a given street use the, the same type? Again, sorting out duplicate names. Duplicate names cause mis-dispatching, uh, bad dispatching. And I know you see it in your newspapers there just as we see it here. The police went to the wrong place and conducted a drug raid on some little 99-year-old grandmother who doesn't know aspirin from ibuprofen. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's just, you don't want to have those things happen. So, you know, get rid of the duplicate names, look at consistency, look at cleaning up that street network. Um, following that, um, you want to create the master street name list. Um, that often takes a while as well. Um, and many, many streets have multiple names. Um, and some are official, some aren't, but um, you often have county road numbers or letters. You have state number, state route and federal route numbers, a local name, and sometimes commonly used abbreviations. So getting all of those things and saying, for each segment of road in your street center line network, what name or names are used for that particular segment? And how does that work? Often a route number will, will occur on more than one street. We have a case in DC with Route 50, US Route 50, where it's on New York Avenue, it's on 14th Street um, as it crosses the district, but not all of New York Avenue and not all of 14th Street are in fact Route 50. So you have to be, it's gotta be done segment by segment. And that this is also a quality thing that often takes a lot of time to straighten out, but you can't really figure out your addressing system until you've done that. Um, street names, um, Here's just some suggestions of, of rules. What can you use? Um, 
sound alike rules, Fourth Street, the number Fourth, F O U R T H, and Fort Street, like Fort McHenry. Um, fort and Fourth often can be confused, especially if somebody does not speak clearly when they're making an emergency call. Um, names that you want to prohibit, uh, names that are offensive, names that um, uh, we've been having a lot of discussion lately of names of Confederate heroes in the South and whether streets should have those names. Um, and some of them are being changed. Uh, other names can be offensive. Uh, brand names can be a problem. If you decide to call the road leading to the Home Depot, Home Depot Street, and all of a sudden it becomes a Lowe's, uh, Home Depot, that Lowe's isn't going to be happy, nor is Home Depot about that, and you're going to have to be changing the names. So those are kind of things you might want to think about, um, whether you use numbered or named streets or a combination, um, streets that aren't continuous, what happens when a street changes direction, uh, length of names, does your, does your sign uh, shop have a limit on the number of characters? Uh, what about words that are not English? Um, or Spanish, um, and use of type words like lane or park or court or the directionals like north as a part of the street name itself. Uh, park Lane Circle is a street that actually exists in a town that I used to live in. Um, and that can be confusing because any of those could be a street type as well as a street name. Um, so those are, those are things to think about in your rules. You want to document those rules as much as you can uh, as you go forward. Um, so those are, those are a couple of things to think about. Um, street types and directionals and modifiers, you may have rules about what, some people associate a specific prefix or suffix type with a type of road. In other words, arterials may only have these types. Um, cul-de-sacs can be called court. They can't be called anything but a court or a um, you know, something like that. Um, what types do you allow? What types do you not allow? The U.S. Postal Service in uh, publication 28 has a list of about 215, it varies, it goes up and down time to time, uh, of types that they recognize along with abbreviations for them, and you might want to take a look. I don't, I've never seen anybody who uses more than about 25 or 30 types in general, but you can look at it and see what you have. Um, again, directionals, are they required? Are they optional? Are they prohibited? Do you use what I call cardinal directions, just plain north, south, east, and west, or a quadrant? Some people divide their city into quadrants and each quadrant has to have its designator with it. Um, Washington DC is one of those. It's, pretty normally, I mean, it, you have to have a quadrant in DC because streets cross the, the um, lines between the, cro the street crosses the line of the quadrant. So you might have 4th Street Northeast and 4th Street Northwest and the numbers would be duplicated on those. So the quadrant designator is terrifically important there. Um, direction, can you, you can prohibit them, you can use them, you can make them optional. And do they occur before or after the street name and type or either place or sometimes both? Um, and modifiers are words that come kind of on the outer edge of a street name like Old North Main Street or Main Street Extended, those extended or old. Um, do you allow that to happen? And do you, allow, do you want it before the street name or do you want it at the end of the street name or both? Uh, so those are things to think about in terms of the rules with street names. Okay, numbering gets a little more interesting. Um, here's the very simple pattern. These are what are the numbers are in sequence, odd numbers on one side, even numbers on the other side, and they are allocated with a metric kind of thing. So the, the buildings in the lighter color um, there are, are, are actually vacant properties, but they still have a placeholder number for them. Um, you don't just put 12 on the next building that comes along, you put it where it belongs metrically. This is one where there's no block break, which means at the cross street, the numbers just simply continue here from 20 to 22. Um, here's one where you break at the 100 block, and some people do this. And this particular jurisdiction assigns theirs as every 10 numbers, again, leaving placeholders for vacant, uh, where we have a vacant property um, in here. 
Um, and then at the block break at the intersection, it goes from the what we call the unit block, which which has no it's less than 99 uh, to the 100 block and then on to the 200 block at the next intersection. So that's a, a patterning that you can think about. Um, you want to look at things like do, if there were if this was a three way intersection uh, rather than a four way intersection, would you break the block there and start the new hundred series or not? Uh, that can be a factor if you have a lot of alleys, because the alley often is not considered to break a block, even if it crosses um, at that point. Um, so question, sequential or consecutive? Um, consecutive numbers are like one, two, three, four, five. There, there's no space in between them, and you've not left any space. Sequential, like the second uh, drawing we just looked at, every the next building in that series was always 10 numbers higher than the one before it. They're still in a sequence. The numbers continue to go up in a, in a recognizable pattern, but the interval went from two in the first image to 10 in the second. And in some cases you base it on a distance or a metric uh, that might be there. Um, is that, um, you know, how far apart are the buildings? Do you want to leave space for additional buildings that may come in between? Um, you, you definitely want to think about leaving space because if you have no number available, if you do the consecutive numbering with no space and then somebody comes along and puts something in between, uh, you can have a real problem with that. So again, look at your rules, look at what you see from the data you have and define and discern your rules based on, anyway. on that. Somebody have a question? Uh, 30 right now uh that i don't know i think it's just okay. uh somebody That's didn't put themselves on mute <laughs> okay i've got um I've got about five more five or six more slides here so you know discern how your community was addressed by the how the numbers work is it consistent do you find out find where there are places where there are breaks everybody will find what we refer to as anomalies things that don't meet your rules don't write your rules to be so elastic that you don't really have a rule. <laughs> make the rule for the 95% and look at the 5% that's left over that really doesn't make sense, like the number one in the middle of the 1400 series, and say, you know, what can we do to fix that? You know, how should we fix that? Um, blocks and ranges, we'll talk about, you can usually find that if you look at your, your uh, MSAG data in your 911. Uh, stuff, um, or just again by looking at how the breaks work as you go. Again, parity, which side has odd numbers, which sides had even numbers, and are you consistent across your entire um, jurisdiction? And where do numbers start? Um, again, is there a single point of beginning? Uh, Washington, D.C., that point of beginning is located in the basement of your United States Capitol. There's a, there's a stone there that shows it, a marker, brass marker. And they start at zero right there at the Capitol building. Um, but other places start, uh, the city of Berkeley starts at the northwest corner out in the bay and works south and east. Minnesota by convention starts at the southeast corner and works north and west with their numbering in counties. Um, it varies from, you know, so where do you start? Um, and does each street start at that beginning point or line with the number one or is there an arbitrary number? And uh, Fairfax County, in order to make all addresses kind of consistent, Fairfax, uh, Virginia, big county here in Northern Virginia, um, numbered everybody with a five digit number. So the starting number in all of their streets is 10,000. They just went to a five digit number. There were too many people who wanted one or two digit numbers because they thought it added prestige and value to their property. And they said, so everybody's getting a five digit number. Um, no matter what. And that resolved a lot of one point uh, addresses that were out of consistency with the scheme. Sub addresses is something you may want to get to uh, depending on your land use patterns. Um, these are addresses that uniquely identify spaces within a building that has more than one occupancy or a group of buildings, perhaps a campus uh, of a university or a, a group of you know, warehouses or a shopping mall. Um, sometimes these are referred to as 3D addresses because they often 
occur in high rise buildings, but it allows you if you have a unit, a, a building with 100 apartments in it on 10 floors to identify when a call is coming in an emergency, which unit within that building and approximately where in the building it might be, which allows your emergency responders to get there faster and more accurately and saves time, which saves lives. So some people need, some communities are using it. Some are saying we're not really there yet. We don't have enough big buildings, apartment complexes, shopping malls, those kinds of things. We're not ready to do that. Um, as a recommendation, if you do nothing else, get your prime, get at least one address for every building you have and every property you have done first, and then go back through and look at where you need sub addresses and work through, the, through those in a prioritized way. Get the big stuff, the stuff with people living in it, high occupancy stuff, and get that done. Uh, places with a lot of um, traffic, like uh, big shopping malls and so on, um, theaters other complexes with, with multiple users, um, because that's where you're going to have the largest volume of emergency uh, calls and uh, first responder needs. Um, you want to include your place names um, and rules as to what can be used and what can't be used. Um, in your data structure, you want to tie that back to some domains of value to help maintain your data quality. The rules become both spatial and tabular in this process. In other words, is this address point within my spatial jurisdiction? And it's a point and polygon question for you GIS folks. Um, but is this, a you might look at, is this a valid community name in the address reference system that you're operating? So if you are Los Angeles County, uh, Rachel has what, 88 city names that are valid community names within her address reference system. But for those of you who are in a, in a city or a town, um, your town name is probably the only value that you want to have in that community name field or that place name field that you have. So it's, it's a way, another way to check your data and make sure that you're not holding data that isn't really valid for you in your system. Again, quality matters here. So there's, there's some other things to think about. Many of you will think about this um, as you go through it. What does the address represent? Is it the center of a parcel? Is it a building centroid? Is it the front door where the driveway leaves the road or the access road uh, is located? And you may want to have points for more than one of these things, particularly where you have a driveway that leaves a public road and may serve two or three houses that are a half a mile back up into the woods or up over the top of a hill. Uh, big estates, big rural properties. Um, I know LA is an urban area um, and I have been to Los Angeles, but um, it, you know, you may have places where you want to have both of those things. Commercial property, you may want to have the front door entrance, but you may also want to have a, a different address, which is where goods and services are delivered to that shopping mall from the backside. And it may come off of a different road and need, need a specific address because you don't want the 18 wheeler rolling up to the front door of the mall or the fancy office building and trying to deliver uh, crates of furniture and um, or pallets of paper for the copying machines. So you might wanna document all of that um, so the guidance for address system rules and a lot more of what I've been talking about here is found in the Federal Geographic Data Committee uh, standard, uh, the section, and I noted the pages there, um, pages 186 to 225. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of stuff um, talking about um, address reference systems and how they work and what rules can be incorporated. The standard itself contains definitions for the, all of these components, uh, a lot of attributes that help you uh, work with them and ways to identify addresses that are out of sync. It also contains, for those of you who haven't looked at it, uh, quality tests for address data, uh, along with um, pseudocode and other information um, on how to test your addresses systematically. Uh, you don't wanna try to just gaze at the map and see that you can find errors. You really want to look for places where things don't work properly. Um, and that will give you some guidance on doing that. Um, the, just quickly, um, you know, consistency matters. People need logic to find things. And 
So look for the patterns, document them, expect to find anomalies. And then remember that addressing works because it's logical and consistent and visible on the landscape. And I don't, I, as a best practice, don't look at changing very many addresses. I think we generally, when we go through even fairly large jurisdictions, the number of addresses that really need to be changed from a public safety point of view is less than 5%. And only change them if in the, in the determination you make and in working with your public safety people, they look at it and say, we can't, based on that address, we could not find it where it actually is. We, it, the, it just doesn't make any sense. Number one, between 1411 and 1413 just doesn't tell us anything about where it is because we're gonna be looking for it down there between zero and three. And that's 14 blocks away. So think about how to, how to look at that stuff. Because addresses have been being done for so long and a lot of people get put in positions to do that work without a lot of training, um, you're gonna get inconsistencies and look at them and see can you live with them? Is there a safety problem? And what do you need to really need to change? And what do you just want to mark in your database? We know this is not the right, it's not in the right place. And we know it's not quite right, but we're aware of it and we know how to manage it. And then you don't spend your time trying to sort it out every single time it comes around. Um, and then finally, um, just document what you've got, um, you know, what area is covered? Who has the jurisdiction? Are there official documents that contain your rules like an ordinance in your development um, ordinance, your subdivision regulations, your zoning um, or other administrative regs and then publish them out including your street name list so, and say you can't reuse these street names but give them a list. Don't make it a mystery that they have to guess. Um, and be reminded that address data is fairly complex. It really needs to be put into a spatially enabled relational database linked to a GIS for display. And it needs to have a maintenance application that helps with assignment updates and doing your quality control testing. Um, and that um, that's pretty much it. Very quickly, um, here's our email. Um, feel free to email if you have questions. We're happy to answer them, particularly if it relates to the standard. Uh, and I'm, we'd be happy to ask your questions for a few more minutes. Um, we have, I have to get off of here in about five minutes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys. That was an amazing presentation. But yeah, if you guys could send the slides, I could post them to our uh, site. Does anybody have um, any direct questions to ask Martha? All right, well, I wanna thank you guys for your time and I really appreciate you guys making the effort and you know, proclamatizing addressing and setting up addressing best standard, best practices and standards um, for everyone. <laughs> well, we hope so. I, there, are, there are standards um, also you know, in, the, in the emergency community. Um, FGDC worked very hard and as, as co-authors, we both worked very hard on making sure that this, the FGDC standard is consistent um, and works well with the, um, the NINA standards and with the postal standards, which are two of the major other um, groups of standards that are out there. So transferring data from one to the other should not be a major issue at this point. Uh, you know, things could change down the road, but at the moment, it's it's very easy to move data from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for the time so much. All right. All right. So next, I think Jeff is going to share his screen again and get us rolling on an update of the CAMS modernization project and tell us where we're at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, most of you, if you're engaged in this meeting, you've probably been uh, a part of some of the activities that we've been undertaking. And if you're not, then we want to make sure that you get tapped into those activities here. Um, so 
We had four major tasks and deliverables. And uh, the first one was educational workshops. We had a addressing um, workshop uh, with a lot of similar material that was covered today um, and, and from maybe a slightly different angle, but, but good to see multiple angles on that. Um, and then we'll also have one on November 16th. We wanna be sure that everybody who's in the meeting today can make it to the November 16th session. Uh, here at the end of the slides, I'll, I'll have a link. Uh, well, it's actually a big gnarly link. So if you haven't received a word of that educational session uh, from Rachel, reach out and let her know. And we're actually going to post these slides, this recording on the hub site and in the slides uh, there, you'll be able to click the link um, for the 11, 7, 16, uh, November 16th educational workshop where we'll be covering the uh, ESRI address data management solution and its deployment model um, uh, recommendations for LA County CAMS. And so you won't want to miss that meeting so that you can start to, to uh, understand what the ESRI ADM solution is and how uh, we see it working for CAMS to help along with uh, the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure that's being built uh, with the CAMS project to coalesce the data that you're creating at a local level, at a county level uh, to validate it and aggregate it and create one regional address data set for LA County. So that's the educational workshops um, and, and be sure that you register for that one. The discovery analysis phase has begun. We've conducted 20 discovery sessions. We're wanting to get with every city that's engaged uh, and understand your addressing workflow and how it uh, the data that you create gets added to CAMS. It's, it's, uh, the intention of them are to be educational for you as well as for the CAMS project here so that we can understand as much about the uh, disparate processes that create data and contribute data to CAMS so that we can make recommendations um, that allow CAMS in its modernization to cover as much as it can as far as getting data from you guys, again, and validating it and aggregating it so you have a regional address uh, point layer and infrastructure set. Uh, the third task is the technical infrastructure, and that's our partners at One Spatial are installing some technical infrastructure to enable that validation and aggregation um, uh, thing, uh, task to take place. That installation is complete and configuration and testing is in progress now. Um, and then actually, I'll just make one more mention on that technical infrastructure task. After this quick update, we're actually gonna spend some time and have some of the folks from One Spatial take us through what that software looks like, how it works, what it does, and really begin to explore what are the validation rules that need to be in place so that your address data um, is assessed for those anomalies that were discussed earlier. Not only those anomalies, but any other, you know, really hyper local anomalies that we can find. What are the validation rules that the one spatial folks need to put in place so that when you submit data to it, you can also get some useful information back that will help you make the data better and better in an, in an iterative fashion so that the regional data set quality uh, is increased and made better and better. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna embark on that conversation after this update. Um, out of that, all of that will come the system design and implementation plan uh, task. And there was a good question in the chat box earlier about what does all this actually mean? You know, where do these rules live? Uh, are there standards for these things? And that's what this test fourth task, system design implementation plan is intended to do. Um, we're gonna take all the input that we receive at the discovery um, analysis sessions uh, from task two, and we're going to coalesce those into a set of recommendations for system design 
and system implementation, including uh, validation rules, like we're going to talk about in a moment, uh, how the address data management solution gets deployed, how that interfaces and, inter and works with the one spatial software to create a modernized CAM system. Along with that, in this uh, task, we're also going to be issuing some regional addressing. Um, I'll, I'll stop short of calling it standards, but uh, recommendations so that there is at least a document so that if a city wants to create their own addressing policy or their own addressing ordinance, that they can uh, have a, a platform to jump from uh, with those recommendations as well as the system design and implementation plan. Um, so we really want uh, to the third bullet points uh, uh, intent. We really need your, in, your feedback to make this um, as good as it possibly can be as sort of crowdsourced so that your concerns and your needs are considered. And your opportunities for that feedback are at the discovery sessions at these CAM user group meetings and at the education sessions. So um, we've reached out to a number of agencies and uh, haven't heard back from them as far as discovery sessions. So the opportunity is open to have a discovery session if you still would like to have one. So if you uh, have intended to uh, communicate back with us about a time for those, but you haven't got around to it, go ahead and reach out to us and let us know that now so we can get it scheduled. The window on those sessions are closing pretty soon. So you'll wanna get with us pretty quick so we can get your input uh, taken down, noted, documented so that we can make it part of the recommendations. With all that said, we are on track for a January delivery of um, all these tasks and com project completion of this, uh, this project, which will lead to uh, Rachel figuring out how she starts to implement the recommendations that are made in the, from this project. Um, that's the, the status of the work progress. I don't know, Rachel, if you want to mention any of, uh, add anything to that as far as um, what everyone can expect out of this, but that is the progress report. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. And so, um, you know, the work that Jeff and the work that we're doing with One Spatial, which you guys will hear about um, in a little bit, um, you know, that's just the modernization portion, you know, getting it more, um, you know, reducing the intensiveness that you guys have to do to submit data, you know, having those bulk data uploads, have it more user friendly and more um, available to you, you know, deploying uh, application, um, build on Esri infrastructure with that address data management solution. Uh, but there's also several other um, projects, I guess you could call them projects, going on um, on the side. We're also looking at and testing out deployment on uh, Amazon Web Services to be hosting a lot of this data and this infrastructure so that we could, you know, build the communication and repository to make sure that there's um, redundancies and, uh, you know, having the capacity to serve you know, you guys and the general public a lot better um, so that there's no downtime, there's no inconsistencies um, that we're building that infrastructure. And then also we are updating the locators or working on updating the locators um, so that they meet a lot or so they have a lot more validation and appropriateness um, for what our users are doing with that, um, with that locator functionality because right now it is built into a lot of the county applications and with a lot of the missing data from the cities um, since you know the hurdle to contribute data has been so high, uh, you know, it's been lacking a little bit. So rebuilding those locators so that it could more easily ingest the data from the cities um, as the whole repository. Uh, so we're building that out as well. Um, and then we're also considering doing, uh, you know, with the world of big data and CAMS is considered a big data set, having the ability to understand the metadata behind it. So with each of the cities themselves, you know, 
each of you guys have your own workflows, your own interest behind having address information. But when that gets sent to a repository and aggregated at the county level, um, you know, it loses some of that um, individuality that it had. And so building a mechanism to track the update cycle, the data quality, the data revisions behind your data. Uh, so we're working on some sort of dashboard to help um, meet that <laughs> and to keep uh, lines of communication open and your data authority, um, you know, mechanisms back and forth from the public. So that if a citizen of your city has an issue, they could track it back and understand that, oh, okay, you know, the city hasn't updated their data in six months. Maybe I should go ahead and talk to my city council or whoever to encourage them to start contributing again, um, those types of things. So there's a lot of work on the background. There's a lot of work in the front ground with this modernization. Um, for these data validations and all those things that Jeff just talked about. Um, so if you guys have questions about anything, anything that I just mentioned, you know, I'm always here for you guys. Um, I really appreciate you guys all coming to this and I'm looking forward to actually getting into the nitty gritty of the addressing rules for the data quality. <laughs> um, I know One Spatial has been a great proponent of ensuring the data is consistent, but without, without forcing you guys to change your schemas. Um, you know, we could build in the data quality rules, what we generally want to see, and you guys are able to help um, cons contribute to that. You guys are able to say, okay, what is a, an inaccurate stub versus an actual, um, you know, dead end street, you know, whether that's five feet is considered an error or 25 feet, you know, um, those types of technical issues we could go ahead and talk about, but I'll go ahead and throw it over to one spatial right now. Um, they could show you uh, what their product is and how CAMS is really going to implement it. Yeah. So I don't know who's going to do the talking from one spatial. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to ask Jeff um, if he was actually going to share something before um, our presentation. No, that's it. Uh, okay. it ready for you. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Marissa, I'd like to uh, call on my colleagues here, Ian. <laughs> Ian, are you on mute? It helps if I get the mute button off. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Brackenridge, and I'm a project manager here at One Spatial. Um, as Jeff and, and Rachel have both said, we're, we're working as a partner of Datamark to upgrade the technical infrastructure part of CAMS. Um, I don't know if we want to do introductions. You'll, you'll hear from Melissa, who's going to give an overview of our, our software and our, our products. But I believe we have John Brady on the call. Do you want to introduce yourself, John? Uh, hi, folks. Uh, John Brady. I've uh, been with One Spatial for about five years now. And prior to that, I spent 10 years as the lone GIS um, guy at uh, in local government. Um, and I, through my experience there, as well as here with One Spatial, um, we're looking forward to working with you all. It's it's something I've been working with for you know the last fifteen years. Thanks, John. I also believe we have Sheila on the call. Yes. Hi, I'm Sheila Stephenson. I'm the CEO for One Spatial Inc. And finally, uh, Brian, are you there? Yes. Hi. Sorry, I'm here. Uh, I'm here with a. Uh, on the sport side of things, the infrastructure that was talked about earlier. Thanks. So we're all going to be working to, together as part of the team. And I'm then going to pass back over to Melissa, who's going to give uh, introduce herself and also kind of go through some of the technical aspect of it. 
All right, thank you, Ian. And I am Melissa Baldo. I'm a solutions engineer with One Spatial, and I work mainly on proof of concept projects. But I've also led some um, training courses and some workshops for various um, some of our customers. So I feel like this is a really good experience to kind of um, hear from the people who are actually using it themselves, right? Um, so just a quick introduction about us. Um, for those of you who don't know why we're here, for those of you who don't know us, um, One Spatial Inc. is a U.S. company that is a wholly owned subsidiary of One Spatial Group out of the out of Cambridge in the U.K. And we've actually been around for over 50 years, but here in the U.S. we're only seven years old. But even with that, you know, we've really expanded to nearly 50 clients. So um, the first one was actually U.S. Census. Um, our projects, what our customers range from, you know, working with addresses, next gen 911, of course, um, transportation data, utilities, spatial data infrastructure projects, as well as facility and asset, manage asset management. Um, we also work with a number of GIS departments on building automated validation workflows, um, performing change detection and cross validation and integration with other departments in their organization. Um, so, my mouse is freezing up. All right. So for all of these different applications that I've mentioned, we maintain a rules-based approach to data quality management solutions. And this is precisely the functionality of the One Integrate rules engine, where you can create automated data by data management workflows out of your business rules. Um, data validation would be the simplest way to establish that baseline set of standards that you want or actually require your data to meet. And by writing out your business rules, you can create data validation workflows that can find anything that fails those rules. If for some reason, you know, your data could use a bit of help to meet those data standards, you can leverage the quality by writing rules that will integrate it with other sources. One integrate also enables you to connect across the entire enterprise. And if needed, you can also tap into spatial and non-spatial data sources in the same workflow. Um, we find that that's specifically um, or especially helpful if you require multiple data sets to be maintained synchronously and um, for a process like change detection, having this integration functionality allows you to customize, you know, how different vintages of data interact and be able to automatically assign how to actually handle these deltas. And then, of course, what it uses there to finding data issues if you don't actually take the step to fix them or improve its quality, you can also write rules to automatically correct or enhance your data in such a way that the next time you run it through the same baseline data validation rules, they'll end up conforming to the data quality standard that you set. Um, so one of the key things that um, I feel in implementing processes like these is um, to make sure that the rules that compose the workflows are kept in a somewhat controlled environment. You know, you don't need 100 rule authors editing these rules. In other words, as we always like to say, you wouldn't want to have too many cooks in the kitchen. So particularly if my role, for example, is just a data contributor, you know, I don't necessarily need to be involved in learning how to write rules and want to integrate. So, Here's a solution built on top of the One Integrate Rules engine that we call One Data Gateway. It is a self-service web portal that has One Integrate running under the hood, and it really provides that environment to share validation and enhancement processes between internal and external users. So I have a quick little animation here to show you potentially um, what this means for LA County and the CAMS data contributors um, on this call, perhaps. Um, okay, so, so to facilitate data, the CAMS data contributors data submission. Oh, sorry, did, <laughs> whoops. I don't know if my, uh, my mouse is actually, all right, I skipped a step. So to facilitate CAMS data contributors data submission, LA County hosts one integrate rules on their server. So contributors can upload their data to one data gateway where it goes through a series of data validation rules. So if there's some issues found, contributors can download those results, giving them that opportunity to actually address those issues themselves. And then once they've cleaned that data, contributors can resubmit um, that same data or that cleaned data to one data gateway. Um, if the quality is at 100% conformance to the rules, one of the things that LA County can include in this um, workflow is to actually have it set up in such a way that the clean data is automatically um, delivered to their server. So it definitely, um, it has, uh, um, it has, what am I trying to say? Um, automated that data supply chain between the two um, different um, entities right there. Um, 
So and with that, let's talk about um, the submission and validation portal infrastructure that um, we actually want to implement between LA County and its local contributors. So there are two main processes that we'll tackle here with the first one focusing on data validation. And we'll be providing rule sets to help you essentially hit the ground running. And of course, we are going to workshop some additional custom rules like Rachel mentioned, including those to configure um, schema standardization. How do you want to tackle that? And, you know, uh, vintage to vin vintage over vintage change detection. So I do want to look at um, these processes separately. Oh. So for our data validation piece, um, these are checks that will sh the, the checks that we're going to share are the essential geometry checks. These are meant to identify the most common types of geometric dirt, as I like to say, in GIS data. We also have essential um, network checks to ensure that there's proper connectivity for our roads. And we are also going to provide the full NINA attribute validation checks. And of course, again, additional custom rules um, to help build a standard for addressing data and other expected relationships between our CAMS layers. So I'll be running a live demonstration of some of these rules actually in a little bit. Um, for our change detection piece, um, the idea behind a process is for contributors to submit their data through one data gateway. We are going to run um, some change detection rules to identify the deltas between the existing um, data versus what's actually being submitted. And then based on various degrees of spatial and attribute comparisons, we are going to identify how the data has changed. You know, do we see a row that needs to be added, something that needs to be deleted, extended, maybe there's a change in address information, um, so on and so forth. So. Um, um, one of the steps that we want to do here is also that once these changes have been reviewed and accepted, those can automatically be um, applied um, to the database. Um, so I guess, oh, sorry, before I move on to the live demo, I do want to mention um, a use case that I'd like to highlight, which is a spatial data infrastructure project that we're working on with the state of Michigan. Um, their spatial data infrastructure contains more than 100 statewide data layers. Um, this includes address points, road center lines, parcels, and administrative boundaries. And these are essentially synthesized into a single data source. And they are made available through an Esri ArcGIS enterprise um, data portal. Um, so the challenge here for it to actually be truly statewide, the city has to rely on data stores from organizations within the state, some federal partners, their locals or their cities and counties, as well as some third party data suppliers. And each of these data suppliers have to go through the Michigan Geographic Framework or MGF um, data supply chain to be fully integrated within the spatial data infrastructure. So we've actually partnered with the state to write out their data to write out their data validation rules um, based on the business requirements of the MGF. And it's these set of rules that their data suppliers need to conform to before these submissions are even accepted. So the resulting integrated data then goes through a larger validation process after the change detection step, very similar to what I just described, um, to ensure that throughout the workflow, um, you know, making sure that no issues have been inadvertently introduced anywhere at any point. Um, so this entire process essentially enables the state to maintain their statewide spatial data infrastructure that can be shared to statewide partners. And as a um, NG901 uh, implementation of this um, side is, well, the setup is really very similar to what I've already mentioned. The NINA rules are based on the NINA standards. They are hosted by the state using one integrate and they have them wired up to one data gateway. It's gonna be very similar to what I'm about to show you. and. Really what's integral throughout this process is that it encourages and it empowers a proactive relationship between the state and their data suppliers. All right, those are a lot of words, not thank you yet. I'm gonna go ahead and do, run a live demo. And what I wanna start on in here is kind of from the perspective of um, our CAMS data suppliers. Let me clear out my pen here. Okay, so this is one data gateway. This is a submission portal that we want to log into. So let's um, let's pretend that I've been given access to LA County's um, one data gateway instance. So I'm just gonna log in. And what I'm seeing here are the assignments or the projects that I've been given access to as they have been set up by the county. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this CAMS data um, validation here as a CAMS data contributor gonna go ahead and hit start a submission. 
and it's asking me for my camps input data. So I'm going to go ahead and just drag and drop a sample of West Hollywood. After hitting accept, what it, what's happening right now is it's trying to figure out what can it naturally map between the schema of the data that I submitted versus a schema that the rules have actually been configured to, um, to run against. So right here on the schema mapping page, it's saying here that I haven't mapped or it can't find um, a class to match my address points to. So I'm going to go ahead on a target and say submit them as my site structure address points. And what I'm going to do is um, roll down the list of the um, the attributes that are expected here. So what I did here just to make it quick was I just um, picked and choose which ones the rules are actually using so we don't have to go through the entire um, table. So for number, I'm going to say read it in as add underscore number. So I have post direction here. Yep, read it in as sc underscore poster. Um, oops, not that one. Pre-direction. Oops, not that one either. Sorry, pre-type. Um, post type. I think I missed post type. Street name, of course. and my postcode. So already in this step, we can see how, you know, you can definitely, um, no matter um, what schema you've brought in, um, it's really up to the person who's submitting to be able to, um, you know, push that in through in such a way that it's accepted by the rule set. Um, so I can do here is hit apply. And one of the things that I did here before um, hand also was I actually submitted roads and address, address points. So at the top here, what I can do is I only need to do this once. And what I can do is save the way that I've just, um, I've just read this schema through. And what I've done here is I already created one for my centerline schema. You can save a different mapping for your address points. And if I can show you real quick how that turned out. Street center lines are mapped over as road underscore center line. And again, I'm just picking and choosing which attributes should match to where. So it does try to um, map as much as it can on its own. But of course, there are some that can just like, it's really far to say zip underscore L is postcode L. But you guys get the idea. So I'm going to go ahead and hit continue now that I'm satisfied. And what this does is it essentially um, kicks off the validation session. And again, we're looking at a camp state of validation se session set up by LA County. And these are the rules that it's asking its camps data contributors to, um, to uh, conform to. So at the top here, we're seeing that it read in some data. It read in my address points as well as some sheet center lines. It's just a very small subset here so we can run it fast and quick. Um, I have three separate rule sets in here. Um, these are the ones that I mentioned earlier. We have our essential geometry checks. Um, these are the ones that are have been written generically. So if you're noticing here, um, this ran on 3057 features because it ran it through both of these um, layers. So that's also kind of the beauty of being able to have these type of rules is that if they've been written generically, we don't have to write multiple versions of these rules for address points and in a separate set for street center lines. It is running against everything. And the way that we read these um, instant results is that, um, again, because these are rules that we're expecting these features to conform to, 100% conformance means nothing failed that rule. So anything that is not 100% means we have non-conforming features. Therefore, we do have instances of duplicate features. We have some kickbacks and we also have some spikes. For our essential network, again, these are meant to look at um, you know, connectivity issues possibly between our road network. Um, and it says here that we do have some overshoots and undershoots and we do have roads that are for some reason not intersected at their ends. And again, these are also customizable if it's something that needs to be um, worked on. And some sample addressing checks. Um, some of these checks are ones that we've already shared with LA County during their um, uh, POC stage. So these are ones that um, I believe they've already seen. But just as an example, these are, again are customizable. We are checking that you know address points are valid. Um, road center lines. Do we all have valid address change values? And the term valid here, or the way that these rules have been labeled, is really dependent on you. It doesn't have to be named this way. Anything in here. Um, 
especially the way that these rules have been named, the descriptions on these rules, they are definitely customizable so that everybody can understand and everybody's on the same page. Um, so it looks like we do have address points that do not have valid um, number and street names because we are not at 100%. We also have um, a road center line with a range that does not have an address point number within the range. I'm going to show you an example of that in a little bit. And check that road center lines have no address range overlaps. And just as an example here, we just ran it on the, um, on the left address ranges. So at the bottom here, I am given a copy of my road center line to my site structure address points in the schema that they have been um, pushed through. So now we're only going to see, you know, the, the ones that we actually mapped over for those attributes. And we have this markup class, which will pinpoint us to the 1,558 occurrences of non-conformances um, in the data. So I'm going to go ahead and hit continue because at the top here, what I want to show you is you can definitely download another copy of the input you just submitted. You can also download an output, which is the export that we just um, we just ran. And another thing that we can do here, and I really like this one, is there is a PDF in here. It's an auto generated report, kind of like metrics um, for what we just um, pushed. Um, so it tells me, uh, you know, how many how many features did I actually submit? Which rules did I run it against? Um, how did my um, how did my data actually stand up to these rules? Where do I have the the worst issues, or where am I failing the most, etc.? So if if this is needed for your organization, it's nice to have this kind of information on hand. All right, so I've downloaded that. Let's go ahead and oop, I'm sorry, wrong folder. And I'm going to do this live. I do want to make sure that. OK, so I've exported out what we just brought in here. I'm bringing it to, us, um, to a, my GIS application of choice. And I've brought in the um, address points and my street center lines that I submitted. So what we're going to see here is, oops, can't find it. Oh, I see. I know what I did wrong here. Give me one second. All right because I deleted the one earlier. All right. OK, so I have a copy of my markup points, my road center line size structure address points. And you'll notice that it would only be on this area for my markups, because this is the, uh, the subset that I cut through in here um, for the submission. All right, and I already pre-marked some of the bookmarks um, here that we might be interested in, um, just so I don't spend too much time looking for them. So in here, we see markups for um, our kickbacks. And actually, what would help here, if you guys can give me a second, is to fix the symbology real quickly. If not, if that's too slow, then nope, let's do it. All right. So in here, what we're seeing is that we have three points that we have been driven to. Um, and in here, what we're seeing is a bit of lag there for ArcGIS Pro. All right. So we're seeing here that we have um, two spikes that are essentially creating um, or composing our kickback right here. So it it dropped a point exactly at the vertices that are causing this type of geometric error to occur. Another one is an undershoot, so right here. And what we did here was, um, and it's definitely configurable, within a certain distance, are these points um, connected? If they're not, then it must be an overshoot or an undershoot. And right here, we're seeing, of course, that um, we do have an, uh, an undershoot for um, the center line right here. Okay, let's move on to some attributes. So in here, we have a road that does not have a name. One of the very basic um, requirements that we have in here. Um, and we're seeing right here that all of these different um, attributes are in fact null. And one of the things I noticed actually was that the road beside it, and it does have its own markup, is also null. So maybe that's kind of one of the spatial, spatial relationships that probably also need to be checked. Um, for address ranges, I found one in here. So it's flagging this road on the left here. Um, so let's start on the right. Is it the right one? Yeah. And again, this was just running um, specifically on the left side. So the one on the right, it is going from 9,000 to 9022. 
but it continues on to be 9020 to 9098. So it's definitely stepping on 9020 and 9022 um, and having that, um, that overlapping address range in there. And one of the nice um, checks that I also really like, like if I turn on my labels here, um, we had this rule and this rule is called check road center line with address range has address point number within, <laughs> I still didn't expand it enough, within the range. So in here we're just saying that if um, my road center line does have address information in there, I should have at least one address point that I can map and say it belongs to me or to my address range. So what we're doing here, I'm just going to grab a sample because right now we're seeing that Dorrington is in fact matching all of these. And if we look at our road center lines um, ranges, um, 8,700 to the high of 87.99 in total, these numbers do look like they should belong there. But the reason why this got flagged is because even though these full names, Dorrington Avenue, appear to be matching, what we did was we were not looking at the full name um, or which is the concatenated field, but we were looking at these um, um, these attributes separately. So street name, pre-mod, pre-deer, pre-type, post-type, post-deer, post-mod. And what we're seeing here for, um, for where is my for the street center line. Okay, here. So the post type here for the street center line is AVE for Avenue. On the address points, the post type is written as Avenue, spelled out. So this is one of the things that uh, Martha mentioned earlier. It's probably a good idea to kind of discuss how should we handle these kinds of um, inconsistencies if we are to mark them as an inconsistency. And one of the things that I probably would suggest is, you know, we already have it correct on the abbreviation. Maybe it's just the way that we want to reconfigure the rules so it can fit um, how our data actually looks like. And I think I do have another, nope, that's it. That's my only markup left. Um, so that's the end of my live demo. Um, we are now open for questions, if there are any questions. So I got a, this is uh, Rachel Marquez. I got a private question. I'm going to go ahead and not name the city that said it, but um, okay. <laughs> whether, <laughs> whether the cities were going to have access to the exporting of um, those markups. Like the. And Rachel, I think that's the plan, isn't it? That's what you want to set up so that then they'll be able to access those back. After yes. They dro drop their data in there. Yes, 100%. So that you guys would be able to go ahead and make some updates, corrections as you see fit, or actually um, use that to justify a lot of your work that you guys are doing um, on the back end to even get reimbursed by the state, um, you know, for the staff time that it's going to take to clean up the data. I know Anybody Melissa other? ran through everything pretty quickly. So if there's I'm any sorry. Other questions or, no, no, it's all good, Melissa. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure that this might be something very new for people. And if there's any mm -hmm. anything that didn't come across um, clearly, um, please feel free to speak up. Yeah, or if you guys want to talk about um, some rules or some things that you, you know, came to your mind on how you would want to use this. Because um, there is a lot of customization that we could do to these rule sets, you know, considering, you know, what is a spike, what is a, you know, overshoot, undershoot type of things um, that we could get really customized with it. If you guys um, say that, hey, you know, we have this scenario that, you know, yeah, we do have a 10 foot stump of road somewhere that needs to have a name and needs to have addresses, you know, we could take that into account. Um, or if you have, um, I'm just, I don't remember the city at this moment, but um, there's a case where there's address points and those address points are assigned to a road name, but the road name that they access the house with is not the same as what the address points are assigned. Um, so those little um, caveats would be very interesting to know. Um, yeah. Anybody have questions, comments? <laughs> I guess um, I just saw that Brandon posted a question. Oh, what is the difference between this 
and map topology rules in ArcGIS desktop. I don't know if Melissa, you want to tackle that one or you want me to. Oh, you can, you can go ahead, Rachel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Brandon, the, the idea and concept is that this is for bulk data uploading. Um, so we can run it on the existing data um, that is there, but when cities are now submitting their new and updated data, we could run through these quality rules as they're submitting it so that they could get the report back out um, and then see you know, their confidence in the data. And then we could post-process it in the back end and integrate it into the overall repository of CAMS data um, and push it forward. So yeah, the same thing, what's the difference between this and ArcGIS data reviewer? You know, it's the, it's the contribution method of the bulk uploading and bulk quality validation as opposed to existing on a desktop infrastructure-based um, working on those rules. I hope that clarifies it, Brandon, a little bit more. And I think Let's Rachel, see. another point about this uh, is that it's all of that on infrastructure and software licensing that the city doesn't have to pay for, but the county is providing as a resource <clears throat> to, to make not only the county's data set better, but for the local to make their data set better as well. Yeah, definitely. Nobody has questions, comments? <laughs> they like that, though. I see. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, I know, Rachel, you mentioned um, trying to kind of spur some conversation around specific types of validations that anybody has peculiarities around uh, from the one spatial team. Is there any specific things that you're looking for as far as feedback so that you can author the rules? Yeah, I'd say that what we're, what we, you know, we do want, and I'm, I'm assuming this is what Rachel wants as well from when we discussed in the past that, you know, ideas on what are some of the types of rules and services that would be beneficial to them beyond just the, the core um, NINA validations, because we realize that the data that you develop may, well, may be going in for the purpose from county of um, being funneled up to the state for NINA purposes, you have lots of other use cases for that data. And so ensuring its, its validity um, is, you know, would be uh, maybe a good point to start. Is that okay, Rachel? Yeah, hundred um, percent. So we had a question about how often would we be able to validate our data? Um, and I think this is, we're gonna leave it open, right? As long as the capacity is there in the, um, the exactly. server has room, right? They'll be yeah. able to submit twice a day, five times a day, 25 times yeah. a day if you really want. <laughs> 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 I would say yeah because I feel like that's the uh, that's kind of like the beauty of having those instant results on demand you know being able to check it at your convenience and it definitely keeps it collaborative and you're it definitely keeps you proactive as a submitter you're gonna say something Sheila no I've said you you basically said what I was gonna say I just say hmm. that really there's not a there's not a limit at least by the software of how often often you can submit. Now, if everybody goes to submit their, their data 25 times a day, Rachel might say, oh, wait, <laughs> because what, <laughs> the way the system works is it's a queue-based system. So when one data set gets submitted, the other ones can be submitted, but they'll wait, they'll wait in line behind it. Now, it does operate really efficiently and effectively um, because there's some um, very unique um, architecture under, underpinning it so that we're able to deal with really large data sets. Um, very efficiently. I mean, that's why we, we work with clients like the U.S. Census and Federal Highways and Caltrans and L.A. County, for that matter. Yeah, and I think when we processed the data before, I think the whole, I want to say the whole data set took like five minutes or 10 minutes. It was something like ridiculously like low. Wait, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was on in-house servers. And now we deployed the software on AWS um, so 
it's most likely going to be a lot faster. <laughs> um, all right. So did you guys want, did you want to talk about the rules? The... Anyone from my team would like to, uh, cause I think we also kind of already discussed maybe the most common pain points probably in addressing data, um, the most common challenges that we've probably seen. Yeah, and I Ian see Michael John. Martin is M Michael Martin's back on. I don't know if he was going to chime in on some of that as well. If any of you guys are trying to speak, you are on mute. <laughs> Just so you know, guys. I was leaving. Uh, I wasn't sure if Michael was going to chime in. Uh, John Brady. <clears throat> I was going to say uh, some of the things that we had, or one thing that we had thought about was kind of in terms of uh, struggles that people might get of going to one schema, I guess, yeah, you know, how their address uh, information is stored uh, internally. Uh, some people have made the jump to the next gen 911 schema. Um, you know, CAMS, you know, is certainly adopting it as, as we've discussed in some of these stakeholder meetings, but there may be a challenge of, you know, in the next gen 911 schema, there are three fields to store address number information. You have an address prefix, address number, and address suffix. Uh, and then you have uh, available to you eight uh, fields for street type or for your street name. Uh, that would be the street modification, uh, the pre street type, um, pre direction. Um, <clears throat> there was one more there in, in, the, in the pre section, uh, there's the street name, uh, the post type, the post modification, uh, post direction, and the other pre is the pre separator. Uh, whereas, you know, some folks um, may be operating at a, a point where they have one address number field and maybe only four uh, street name fields. Um, it might be limited to a pre direction, street name, street type, and, and post direction. And there may be uh, some challenges to get from one to the other. Oops, John. Sorry, I was talking on mute that time. But are, are, do do you see, foresee that we can help them overcome those challenges through the rules? <clears throat> I believe that we can come up with rules to. Uh, yes, overcome some of those challenges, or at least to alert, um, to say, you know, we may have a non-conforming address string. Uh, let's take a look at that. You know, sometimes just getting driven to, to where potential issues are, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in that list, so to speak. Right. So I think, um, I think maybe the challenge here is that, you know, we we know that you guys are experienced in addressing and know the general addressing rules um, from, because you guys have been in the discovery sessions um, that we've had with the various cities over the last month or so. Um, from those discussions, have you guys noticed any other things that you would suggest for us to build out? And maybe we could get other cities to chime in. I know one that, um, you know, always comes up and, you know, was even a question on here about the parcels, the county assessor, um, and the association with the APN number on the address point. Yep, I remember that too. I can't remember which city it was that brought that up. Actually, it might have been brought up by a few. And yeah, actually just few. Bound, boundary issues in general, I would say. Um, I think I remember those coming up in discussions. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think or how can your software help manage the, um, well, in Nina speak, it's called the provisioning boundaries, but we have several cities that manage the address information for other cities. Um, how can that be taken into account with the the software and how do we minimize the duplication of where, you know, one city has to input the addresses for, you know, a block away from their own jurisdiction. How do we manage that? 
So John, this is you. And I guess while he's getting off mute, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that also falls into the road segments. You know, how do you manage the, uh, is it called abutments? Like where they, yep. where they need to meet at the city jurisdiction or the county jurisdiction lines? Well, so that's interesting because that's a, a project that we have going on with a number of other entities and, and actually at a national level looking at a pilot with federal highways and um, where they're trying to create the, the starting with the national um, interstate uh, road network, um, but eventually to include all roads. And so there's a number of ways you can do that. And one of the ways is to actually um, get those, the, you know, let's say you have two neighboring counties and you look at the road center lines and, and the system can identify where they, um, they should be a match. And like most often they're not, but then the system can automatically calculate an appropriate point based on a number of, of different parameters to where that those two um, road center lines should meet. And what we're looking at potentially doing in the case of the federal highways is creating that proposal point of where those two should meet. And then the two neighboring, in this case states, but in, in the case of LA County, the two neighboring jurisdictions um, could look at it and agree, yes, that's a good spot for them to connect or agree, no, this is where it should connect and actually reposition that point, then the rules engine can automate the process to tie those together. Is that what you're thinking, Rachel? Yeah. And so there's other use cases too. There's things like looking at, especially from um, uh, municipality to municipality, how well do the boundaries align and are there overlaps or are there gaps there and identifying those, those kinds of things and also creating proposals of how to resolve them. And, and again, being able to automate those processes with the approval of the, of the, um, the jurisdictions. Or I should say the agreement amongst the jurisdictions. So, John, do you have anything to add further on the on the addressing process? And I was gonna, um, <clears throat> I was, you know, looking in on the the uh, the one question that was asked. I don't quite have an answer for that one yet, but but I will um, at least by email later. But uh, a potential, you know, a potential idea uh, is in terms of. Do I have a road center line that has range, uh, but no associated address point? Uh, and maybe, you know, if I, if I, you know, say that, hey, my address or my road has a range, I should have addresses associated with it. Um, maybe that uh, would lead to a conclusion that I haven't produced those address points yet, um, even though the the road is there, it's been uh, provided a range, and there may be development occurring at that location that you know, needs uh, emergency service if, you know, if one was called upon. And Melissa, I know you've done a number of, of implement, uh, sort of proof of concepts and also trainings around this kind of effort. Do you have any thoughts you want to add? No, but there's definitely more than one solution for every problem. And it really, I feel like that's the value of the workshops that are included in this um, uh, in the, in the game plan that we were showed um, earlier. And because um, it really, it matters to hear what kinds of challenges some of these um, jurisdictions might encounter in trying to get to, you know, um, to meet a single requirement, for example. And, um, you know, the more that people can actually express um, you know, how hard um, or how easy maybe it could, um, it would take them to get their data to a certain standard. Um, there, there could be other ways to solve that, um, that problem. If that makes sense, um, which is why, again, I feel like it's very valuable for um, for people to kind of um, know where their data is at right now and how they can actually, um, you know, with probably the minimum um, effort to get that read across for LA County for that data to be um, usable, because you do want to be able to make the most out of that existing data. 
You know, and, and one of the other things that might be of interest too is that then, and I think uh, Melissa did a little bit of a demonstration of this is that, that I know one of the concerns is the standardization of able to, the ability to standardize addresses into a NINA format. I know if I remember right, one of the cities was really interested in doing that. And it can be done automated through, you know, like a permanent process, or it could be done through the, the schema mapping on the one data gateway. And then once that's set up once, every time you go to submit and validate the data, that, that schema map translation is done automatically. So it's not, doesn't need to uh, uh, be redone each time. So it looks like there's another question. Yeah, can anyone or any CD share experience for collecting gated community private street information and address points? Does, does anybody have any experience with that? Did you guys all fall asleep during these presentations? <laughs> and, I bored them with my slides. <laughs> does, does this imply, um, I, I guess, that the grounds are entirely private and that the City is not responsible for the maintenance of the roads, and therefore may not those roads may not uh, enter into uh, a city's GIS or, or or street guide. Is that potentially where we're getting to? Yeah, yes. Um, I know my experience was, um, <clears throat> you know, working with the. Uh, uh, ultimately, it, it, there was a lot of internal policy that needed to be uh, developed and communication channels um, established. Uh, and so, you know, we knew, I knew that our planning department and our engineers uh, were the first, you know, folks to be aware. The engineers were receiving, you know, digital plats. Um, you know, the, the planning department was, you know, approving subdivisions or, you know, reviewing them. And, and identifying, you know, these, these key moments in um, the land management system, so to speak. And, you know, where does, you know, what actions that uh, occur would trigger, you know, some other action. And, um, and so in something like a gated community, knowing at the developmental phase, you know, when the plats were received and approved, that that was the trigger point to say, hey, I've got to digitize these roads because you know they will we will provide emergency service to them even if we're not maintaining them by public works, um, and you know we had a yeah I just embedded a field I forget what I called it it might have just been a um, um, you know private public I, I forget what I called the field but um, you know there was effectively two or three different values that I could choose and. So in that instance, I would have chosen private, uh, you know, the, these roads rep represent a private network. Um, and then the addresses uh, had, a, had a method in place where, um, you know, they were, I knew at the time of development that it was coming from a large parcel going down to a smaller parcel. And I would, um, and once we knew that the, the plat was approved, that I would just assign the addresses to the, the master uh, parcel. <clears throat> and then when the assessor's office um, finally uh, you know, updated their land record so that there was an actual parcel record, I would then, you know, after the fact, um, associate those, those addresses with the, the parcel. That was somewhat of a, of a manual effort on my part, but you know, we had the the, the notification policies in place that I was able to do that, but we had to have those addresses be, um, prior to because the the building the permitting folks needed to issue permits to those addresses as opposed to the you know the, the larger parcel that those things were coming from. Yeah, I think Victor, you also had a question about uh, mobile heart mobile home park address like space numbering that can be, I've seen that be lots of ways sequential. I've also seen it be split uh, even odd on either side of the road, especially where they had uh, sort of an alias name for those private roads. 
Yeah, yeah, this from our experience. So that's why I wonder any any kind of uh, idea or suggestion to work on this kind of addressing. So that's interesting. We were just um, um, on a call this morning with the state of New York because they're looking at the same sort of thing because with the 911 and, and newer requirements where mobile homes may have once upon a time had their streets on the major whatever road it is that went into the park because those park streets might not have been named now that they're being named. So they're looking at how can they automate the processes to take those named streets and street ranges that have been assigned there um, and then ought to automate the, the um, creation of the address points. Is that something along what you're thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I just uh, just shared the experience. So probably uh -huh. you, can, you can provide more you know, helpful information. Yeah. Absolutely. I think as well, if you're talking about a space number or a unit number, you're talking about a sub address element. It's a different story than if you're talking about each unit having their own whole address number. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what New York is doing. I think the New York of, is moving the towards that. The kind of thing. sub address elements. Uh, is can be arbitrary and it doesn't really impact that much. But if you're talking about it being having a main number off of a off of a named road, then there does need to be some coherence to how that the number gets assigned. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. I think this is um, some good conversation and hopefully you guys will have things to take back to your city to think about and consider. Um, I just realized that I have not posted um, the names or information on uh, the types of rules that are already written that might um, want or need to be a little bit more customized to our specific area. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that down for me to do and post it on the CAMS hub site just so you guys have a little bit more um, background on, you know, exactly what we're thinking about implementing. Uh, and then you guys could bring forward any other specifics that you want, um, you know, that might work for your city or that you want to consider or you want to try to troubleshoot within your jurisdiction. Um, I think that might be helpful for you guys. And then, um, and Rachel, one way to approach this that might be useful, it's very similar to what we do with, um, um, on the transportation side of the house, we have some work that we're doing with HPMS and we have kind of a community there and the community comes forward and says, um, as a whole to federal highways, it would be very helpful if we had validation that did X, X and X, right? And so then mm -hmm. they're beneficial to the broader group and then those get thrown into the mix of, of what should be provided out. Yeah, I think we could start something like that. Um... I see that Jeff has the the CAMS hub site up. Perfect. Um, I could also um, send everybody invites to the uh, Slack page that if we want to have this kind of discussion in in-depth detail, um, just so we don't bore people that don't um, don't find this as interesting as some of us, <laughs> um, we could start the conversation and you know build out a lot of these rules and other customizations that we really want. Um, hopefully that works for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to make sure that if anybody wasn't aware of the hub site address, they have an opportunity to, to take it down here and become uh, familiar with it and engaged with it because you put a lot of good information on there. And, and I'll just remind everybody that the slides here from both um, this slideshow and Melissa's, uh, and we're going to get uh, the Wells slideshow as well, uh, and put that all up there as well as the recording from this uh, this meeting here. Yeah. So, so in order to find those resources, if you want to uh, revisit. Yeah. It's going to be on the CAMS modernization drop down. Um, I'm still working on some programming issues with that uh, drop down bar, but I'll hopefully get them fixed uh, either today or tomorrow. 
Um, but yeah, they'll all be posted there so you could have reference to it uh, and then build up your knowledge base. So, um, I don't also, know what... I added in here to Rachel, just a reminder about GIS Day because we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I wanted to be sure that the link got in the slides for greater reference. But I, I wanted you to kind of take a minute to talk about what you're planning for from the CAMS program perspective at GIS Day um, and how that relates really to the modernization project because you, you're going to make some time available. Yeah, so I have, um, so for GIS Day, the CAMS program is going to be an exhibitor. So we're going to have a virtual booth there uh, built on Experience Builder. Um, to provide you guys a little bit more information on what the CAMS modernization is, why it's, um, you know, inherently important, um, even though it's not as visual as some other projects. Uh, and then I am going to be doing a talk on the California Next Generation 911 project and how that relates to the CAMS modernization and why um, the state is willing to give the County of Los Angeles and U cities um, funding uh, to contribute addresses and to get it, um, get to meeting some of these standards that we're laying out um, because it is gonna be a collaborative effort and this data is used for big data and open data initiatives, um, not only within the county and the various departments, um, you know, such as children and family services, uh, you know, tax assessors stuff, voter registration, all those types of things, but also with the state, um, the various departments there uh, want and need to start using local provided addresses for uh, the benefit of all. Um, so it's really important. Uh, there are those you are able at that exhibit to schedule one on one meetings with me. Uh, if you want to talk any specifics, challenges that your particular city is having, whether you need um, some more uh, support and backing to talk to your city management or your leadership about CAMS, um, I'm you know more than willing to do that. I think I have it so that people are able to schedule meetings with me um, for two months after after the event and or before the event. <laughs> um, so um, I'm just trying to make myself as open as possible to be a service to you guys and provide the best um, communication and detail that I can. I think that's what you're getting at, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's some opportunities to connect uh, at virtual GIS day that maybe you yep. don't uh, bring up a bunch of stuff in the middle of the CAMS user group, that's understandable but take the opportunity at GIS Day to kind of get some time on Rachel's calendar or just email her, right? We're all yeah. friends, small community here and and reach out and, and touch someone. And Jeff, I think Data Mark has, is having a booth as well, right? And I know we are as well. That's correct, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so you could visit either of our, our organizations and, yep. and uh, learn more. Yep, that's right. Um, okay, so let me let me just back up to one more. I want to make sure that everybody knows about the 1116 CAMS Education Assessor, and we've already talked about it. But uh, there is a registration link. It'll be in the slides on the on the site, and I'll I'll um, what will I do? I can take the registered names if it's okay with you, Rachel. I can take the registered names, so we could send an email to everybody on that. Yes, I, definitely. I think we've already done that, but. It was also along with a link for this meeting. So we'll just resend it out with just the education session. Yeah. And so for those who, um, you know, whether we missed explaining it or whether you missed hearing us explain it, um, I don't remember which, but we're thinking, so as we release this address data management solution, uh, I want to say in February, mm -hmm. um, and it's better than their local government data model. It's actually a pro project that integrates with several different applications and services, um, but it provides more logic behind the address um, management deployment, I guess you could say. Uh, 
So, you know, we could build in customized rules. And if your city is, you know, a one person shop that manages addresses, this would be a perfect way for you to build in a lot of the rules so that you could have, say, a part time person uh, do, doing your data entry without having the overhead of having to teach them the entire logic of addressing. Um, it's a lot, it's gonna, you know, facilitate the education and the input of addresses a lot more clearly. Um, and then with the county, we're wanting to go ahead and deploy this for our uh, public works department that does the addressing for the unincorporated so that they could have a better or more usable application because uh, currently they're using the old CAMS application um, that probably none of you have ever seen or wanted to deal with. Um, so this is just a way to go and bring it to modern times to be able to use a lot of the Esri resources available and also to get a functional solution so that the processing and time to input addresses is reduced by pre-configuring a lot of the rules and solutions of you know left-right addressing, making sure the road segment name matches the road the road on the address point those types of things uh, and so you know we're hosting this educational session um, not only for you cities to consider whether it'd be beneficial to you but also for our county staff that's doing data entry um, for for the manual input of addresses as you you know come across it on a day-to-day -day basis um, so that's that narrative. <laughs> so, and Rachel, I just had one other thought and I was thinking back yeah. to the, um, Martha, Martha's presentation yes. and her discussion about here are the best practices. If you think in terms, if you're, you're trying to wrap your head around, how would I define a rule? You take those best practices that are associated to how you do addressing for your area and put those into those words like she put, and those become the rules to validate that the addresses are following that those best practices. Mm, yeah. I was thinking the same thing because it really did seem like a nice wish list kind of to kind of build on if that's what your county's experiencing or that's how your data currently looks like. Right. Or even more so importantly, if it doesn't look like that. Oh, yeah, 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 that. <laughs> um, sorry, I had, this is Michael at uh, One Spatial. Um, <clears throat> not sure if you showed it, Melissa, but in One Data Gateway, you can also have thresholds to say that, you know, as Martha was saying, 95% of my data does match this. There are going to be exceptions, but if 95 matches, then we're good. Right, I did forget to um, show that because I that did kind of get into my head when Martha said we can, you know, if 95% is fine, then the outlier 5% issues can wait till later. Yes, absolutely. That's something that we can adjust within um, the, the submission portal of One Data Gateway. I love it. <laughs> All right. Um, so as we're wrapping up, I think we're wrapping up. I don't know what time it is. Oh, yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, curse words for me? Um, <laughs> you know that I'm always available. Um, that's my email address. If I don't respond within a week, please re-email me and say, hey, what the heck's up? Uh, <laughs> that happens sometimes. So questions, comments? Hopefully this was beneficial to you. I know Martha um, is a wealth of knowledge. Um, all right, so if there's nothing else, no other questions. Um, I really appreciate everybody attending. Thank you to our consultants, contractors, Datamark and One Spatial for being on here. Um, I know Martha's not on anymore, but uh, thank you for her and her husband and their company, um, Spatial Focus, for um, contributing and providing us some recommendations for us. Um, and when will the One Spatial Portal be up? Uh, it is up now, but I haven't gotten it completely configured. Uh, since you're the first person to ask that question, I'll go ahead and uh, 
have you be the first tester of it when I do uh, <laughs> when I do get there everything go. running. <laughs> um, oh, you just made somebody's day, Rachel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, Rachel. Yes. This is Jonathan Robinson, uh, Pasadena. I have a question. So as far as access to that portal, how will that be managed? It is going to be a web base. Um, so an internet site, right? Um, one space. Yeah, Michael. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's correct, Rachel. And um, <clears throat> we have a, a number of different capabilities as far as the authentication goes. It can hook into LA's um, SAML or OAuth, um, or they can be separately maintained. Um, but you'll be logging in with a, a email address uh, and some sort of password, whether that's a, a single sign-on password or one that's specific just for Data Gateway. I'm leaning towards more just the independently managed Data Gateway one. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably that a smart question? move. <laughs> it's probably a good idea. Yes. Does that answer your que question, Jonathan? Yeah, that's. I was curious on the the authentication method. Um, so email and then password. Um, then I guess you know we get passwords sometimes. Will there be a model for support if you or is it just hey I forgot my password kind of thing and you click a link? Um, right now it'll um, probably be an email to Rachel if we if it's a one data gateway managed one. Uh, when it's an OAuth one, then you'll use the existing OAuth password reset information. Got it. Perfect. And Thank you. Sure. I was going to say, on the first one, you'll get an email to say, here, click on this link, and it asks you to set up your password if it's um, a one data gateway tied authentication. Cool. Well, I really appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for attending. Um, feel free to reach out to me, attend the Esri Address Data Management Workshop and GIS Day because that's so much fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Cool. All right. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.